Okay, so welcome back after the spring break. The second half of the semester, we were covering more system and uh, network uh, network security concepts, and also it will be a little bit more hands-on on the than the first half. So the first half of the class, we started a lot of crypto things, uh, some access control models. Uh, the second half, let's say, how we can apply those concepts to more um, real-world security issues. So um, last class, we talk about the OS security and uh, OS itself, it's a software. So for the next several sessions, we will talk about software security. And uh, uh, some of you took, several of you took my software security course. So you can see things are similar to what I talk in that class. Um, so <clears throat> the next several sessions, we'll just give you a sense what uh, software security is about. It's not try to be uh, as in-depth as that standalone software security class. So. Obviously, there are all kinds of software, uh, web itself, uh, JavaScript is software, and the security problem JavaScript is facing is totally different from the binary software it's facing. So uh, in this class, I will cover those high-level languages, but mainly talking about the binary software. So when I say binary software, I mean software uh, that have uh, assembly, like kind of like uh, instructions, and directly run on top of the CPU. Uh, those software are actually written in high-level languages as well. For example, many people will argue say C++ is a high-level language. Of course, some people also will argue C++ C and C++ are not high-level language. But anyway, those are the languages we are talking about. So. <laughs> Uh, so first, we will look at how those languages are compiled, linked, and loaded into the system, uh, then what kind of problems they may have. So how many of you are still coding in C? OK. OK, only three, four, five. So only several people are still coding in C. So most of you coding in Python now or other languages? Yeah. So if you are writing low-level code, you are, if you are doing uh, OS kernel, if you are doing embedded systems, uh, it's still very likely you are going to code a lot in C. Uh, of course, there is a trend that uh, many will uh, switch to Rust, but um, the performance cost of Rust at this point, it's not very clear. Uh, previously, we thought Rust will be very efficient, maybe as efficient as C or C++. But right now, there are new evidence showing that sometimes it's not that efficient. So we don't know yet. So uh, that's why I say we'll still be here for a while. Uh, also, there is a large uh, legacy code base uh, written in C. Uh, the Linux kernel is written in C. We're not going to replace that very soon. So when you develop uh, in C, uh, what happens is you write in the C language, C++ language, and you save that into a source code file. So that source code file is basically human readable text. And that source code file will get pre-processed by part of the compiler and generate some .i file. So if you use GCC directly, you probably do not see this process because GCC do not necessarily save those intermediate files onto the file system, but it actually happens. You can tell GCC to save those files. Uh, after that, GCC or other compiler could compile this into assembly code, .s files. So even if that's assembly code, it's still human readable. Even though many of those instructions directly map to the machine code, directly map to machine instructions, uh, but right now it's still text. It's not really machine code. Then those assembly code are assembled uh, into uh, machine code. And each C file eventually becomes one dot O file that's an object file. And that object file, several, many object files can be linked together and they become 
uh, an executable. And that executable can be loaded into the memory and uh, can execute. <laughs> so um, the loader in the Linux system, which is technically not part of, some of that is part of the operating system in the kernel, some of them is not. So that loader will validate uh, whether the user has a permission to run the program, whether the computer, the kernel, has the resources to run the program. So the operating system will set up a new process uh, for the program. Uh, for Linux, setting up that means also setting the virtual address space because each process has its own virtual address space. Then the operating system will map an uh, interpreter into that virtual address space. So that interpreter technically is not part of the kernel. It runs in the uh, user net. And that interpreter will try to load your program and execute that um, program. So um, in the Linux we are using right now, uh, the loader, the interpreter, is actually this file. It's um, under library, uh, the loader, linux.so. Uh, you don't have to remember that, but uh, I just have an idea that this is technically not part of the kernel. So we will look at several uh, concrete examples to understand uh, what's going on here. So here we have uh, three files. Two of them are .c files. Uh, one of them is .h. Uh, the main .c function, very simple. We have a simple C program here. Uh, the main function, the right-hand side, you can see the right-hand side. Uh, the main function, in the main function, we have two local variables. A and B, then uh, we check if there are three arguments. Uh, in Linux, the first argument will always be the program itself. So you, when you run this program, you actually give two more additional arguments. Uh, the, the Linux, uh, the shell will actually give the first argument, which is the name of the program you are running. So uh, if the arguments, total arguments number are not three, it will print out a usage. Uh, basically, it's just one string. The string says adding two integers uh, together with also and uh, 50. So the usage is just A and two numbers. That's it. After that, uh, if there are three arguments, then we are going to change the first argument from a string. So whatever you gave in the command line, to the program, that's a string. That's a lot of integer. So we change that uh, string. Uh, here would be ASCII string to an integer. Then the second one also to an integer. Then we just add them together, also with a 50 here. Um, then we just add them together. Here we are calling actually the add function. As you can see that the add function is defined in another program, in another .c file, and in that, .c file, we have um, a base, which is 50. Then we have a function defined, which is return a plus b plus base. Then we have a .h file. So usually when you compile this, you just do uh, gcc, uh, all those files together. Then you generate the binary. So what you can also do is you use the save temps option, which were save all the tem temporary files in this case. So if we go back to, go, go to uh, my system for the software security course, uh, by the way, this, this system is open to everyone at UB. Uh, you don't have to take my software security course to uh, use the system. You just need to register using your, your UB account. Uh, some of you took a software system, software security course maybe one year ago uh, with me. If you took like one year ago, the system was not ready. So we developed this uh, in the last year. We have been using the system for uh, two semesters. So let's go to the AND one. So AND, let's take a look at AND32. So 32 here means 32 bit. So you log in the system, you just uh, click run the challenge. Uh, what happens is uh, we will create a Docker uh, container for you. 
you can SSH into that, or you can just uh, click uh, the terminal button on uh, on this GUI, then which directly connect you to that. So when every one of you do this, you will have a separate separate Docker container, so you will not interfere with each other. So if you do say here, then you can run the program at, which in this case is miss at. So you can run this program, right? So this this is obviously not correct because I'm not trying to be correct. This is end of 50 there. Um, so when we, I think this one I have for, oh, this one I have source code here. So if we go to source code here, you can say I have, let's go to add. We have, we should have all the source code here. We should, uh, we have all the source code here. We also have uh, the make file here. So if we just do a make, then we are going to uh, generate all the files. As you can see here, uh, we are generating, first of all, this and 32 that's the resulting battery executable you can run. Um, however, we are also saving other temporary files. Um, if you just do a simple compile without using that save terms, uh, those files will never be saved. However, here you can say uh, we have dot i file dot s file dot o file, and if you just do cat the dot i file, which usually you do not say, you can say this this is a still this is still a readable file. This is still a readable C file. So the original the original C file looks like this. There is a, a include statement, there is a micro, uh, all of those are gone. Those are, um, the include is replaced by a function declaration here. Uh, that macro is expanded to the real number here. Okay, so we don't have those anymore. So that is what the preprocessor did in this case. Then after that, we get a .s, which is an assembly file, and each file, each C file, will generate its uh, corresponding .i, .o, .s file. So the .o file, it's, it's a binary already. So if you do cat .o, you will find that um, it doesn't really make much sense because it's already, it's already a binary file. Okay, this one is not supposed to be uh, human readable. Of course, even if it's a binary file, there will be human readable strings. So for to read those kind of files, you need to use tools like uh, object dump. And if you do an object dump dot o, you can say um, this is a, there is one function in this file which is an add function, and that add function has only five instructions. That's it. Those are the machine instructions. Those are not uh, text anymore. But if you do cat the dot s file. You can say those are those are similar things. They are basically the same thing. Here we have uh, this instruction, and uh, this is the instruction. But this is assembly code. This is human readable. This is a real binary. And uh, there are other instructions for security purposes, like the end br thirty two. Uh, that's uh, that's a new feature for uh, control flow integrity, uh, which we will not cover in this class. Then there are in the .s file, we have other uh, assembly directives, statements to tell you what fi this file is, how should we align things, where should we uh, put a different uh, statement, uh, at which section, uh, what is the size should be, those kind of information. So using this example, you can say that um, even a very, using a very simple program, you can say, uh, how the compiler works. Uh, of course, uh, we also have a 64-bit version of this program, and if we compare that, uh, where is 64? And 64. So this is a 64-bit version of the same C code. 
Um, but if we do a object dump, you can say this is a 64-bit version, and if you look at the add function, this is from the exactly same C code. So previously we saw that there were five instructions. Uh, now it's only three instructions. Uh, the instruction that do calculation is actually only one. So previously uh, we have several instructions to move things. Now at a 64 bit, uh, just we only need one instruction to do the job. So that's why uh, 64, 64 bit version of the CPU uh, will be much faster than the 32-bit version. Uh, if we look at another example with uh, uh, long, with 64-bit uh, addition, uh, you can you can clearly tell that it's uh, much faster. So this is a program. Uh, L here means long addition, which is 64-bit. So uh, in the Next uh, two weeks, uh, we will look at several vulnerabilities um, in binary code. We will look at um, uh, buffer overflow. Uh, I have many buffer overflow challenges there. Uh, you, can, uh, you can run those challenges. Uh, we are also looking at uh, return-oriented programming and also heap-oriented attacks. Uh, we will see concrete examples there. Uh, we will not go very deep, not as deep as uh, the software security class. In that class, each topic we spend several weeks there. So having many different levels, you go, uh, you go from the, the I would say, the beginning level to more of a, a more advanced level. Uh, this one, we are going to touch several topics, but all at the beginning level, so you can uh, have a taste what it's like. So. To understand uh, those things, today I'm going to give you some background knowledge uh, that will help you understand next. Um, so most of the CPUs we are using right now, we are still using the x86 uh, architecture. Um, most of your laptops are still at x86 architecture. Uh, some of you are using the M1, M2 uh, Mac and uh, those are changing to the ARM architecture. Uh, so in my research, we actually mainly work on ARM, but for my teaching, I'm still using x86. Um, so x86, all the servers, uh, most of the computer you're seeing uh, before uh, this architecture. Um, obviously, uh, some of the uh, terms we use here, uh, a byte is eight bits, a word is two bytes. A double word could be uh, thirty-two bits. Uh, so you don't have to you don't have to memorize those. Um, so the Intel architecture x86 or ARM architecture, uh, they are both using uh, uh, the Indian S they are using is called Little Indian, uh, which means the least significant byte has the lowest address. Uh, let's say we have a value uh, which is in, in hex, uh, 78, uh, 56, 32, 12. This is a value. This value takes uh, four bytes, obviously. Because this is a little Indian architecture, the least significant byte will have the lowest address. So who is the least significant byte here? That's 12, right? 12 is a least significant byte, which means when we store those four bytes in the memory, that, that 12 in hex will store at a lower address. If we store the whole thing, the four bytes, at address zero, means 12 will be stored at address zero. 32 will be stored at address one, uh, 56 stored at address two. So that is little Indian. Uh, some Architectures, they use uh, big Indian, but I do not see many architectures like that anymore. I, I believe some version of MIPS probably use big Indian. I use some version use 
little big endian before, but most of the architectures right now just use little endian. So it does, this one doesn't really matter. It's, it's not like one endian S is better than other. Uh, it's just a, uh, a history there. People have been using that for a long time. Uh, if you, if you search endian S on Wikipedia, I believe you can even find some weird endian S. They do not really strictly follow I put the least specific unique bytes in the lowest address or the least specific bytes at the highest address. They put kind of rearrange that. They put the least specific in the middle. Uh, some of the architecture in history did that. Uh, I don't know what's the motivation. Uh, it's a little bit weird because this part doesn't really matter that much. So for x86, uh, there are eight uh, general purpose registers, uh, one flag register, and also one um, instruction pointer register, or EIP. That one has the address of the next instruction to execute. Uh, there are many other special reg purpose registers, but at the user land, you probably never will use those registers. Uh, many of those registers, you will only use them when you are in the kernel. So those are the eight general purpose registers, uh, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. Those are four, then ESI, EDI, uh, ESP, and uh, EBP. So ESP, ES, EBP, they actually have some uh, special purposes. Uh, ESP usually is used for the stack pointer. Um, EBP is used for the base pointer. Uh, so a lot of attacks, the buffer overflow attacks we do, uh, they, uh, uh, we need to pay extra attention to those two registers. So EAX to EDX usually are for general purpose computation. Um, for historical reasons, so uh, when did uh, 8086 came out? Maybe in the 80s or 70s. So it's like... It's already like 60, uh, 50 or 60 years ago when Intel released their first CPU or the first several CPU, uh, 8086 or 8080, 8088, yeah, their CPUs. There were 8-bit CPUs. They were not 32-bit. They were not 64-bit. They were only 8-bit. So the registers had different names. Back then, register is not called EAX. It's just called AL or a BL, that's only 8-bit. So to make your software compatible, uh, even for this latest CPUs, you can still, you can still address those uh, parts of the register. So the EAX register itself is 32-bit. But if you run a program that was written 40 years ago, which is only using AL, you can still run that. Okay, because uh, this part of the register, you still have the name AL. Um, then, so ESI EDI was introduced later, not the very first CPU, I believe. That's why they don't, they, you cannot address the 8 bit of that. So uh, S here means source, uh, D here means uh, destination. That's how you remember that, not necessarily how you use the registers. But usually we use that. At a circuit level, for example, if you want to do some um, calculation, you want to add the two things, you usually will use the register EAX to do that. Uh, at a circuit level, there could be some optimization to, to make addition on a EAX uh, faster than doing that on other registers. Then there are some flags to uh, indicate the state of the program for example, if you add two 32-bit numbers together, if you multiply two 32-bit number together, uh, what could happen? Overflow could happen. So if there is overflow, how do we indicate there is overflow? That's why we have a <coughs> flag register. Uh, the 16-bit 16, the version is called flag, with E mean it's 32-bit. So the CPU right now we're using is 64-bit. So they uh, changed the name again. Uh, there are carry, 
beat, uh, parity beat, uh, zero beat, and also sine beat. Now there are several others, but uh, uh, for username, it's not that important. Uh, the instruction pointer, uh, this is also a register. This is a very important register. Uh, every architecture has a register like this. They may have different names. Uh, on ARM, it's called the program counter. In Intel, it's called the instruction pointer, uh, IP or EIP, or 64-bit, it's RIP. Uh, basically, this register has the address of the next instruction to execute. That's what it is. Um, there are many more other registers um, for 32-bit uh, and also 64-bit. Um, you can say there are XMM registers. Those are multimedia registers. I think they were introduced uh, uh, 20 years ago uh, when, I was in, when I was in high school or middle school. I remember excited playing video games because uh, Windows and Intel launching multimedia technology. And that's when they introduced those registers. But those registers has been extended uh, over the 20 years. You can see they are basically much bigger than before. Then we can have here, we have those general registers we looked at, uh, EAX, EBS, ECX. Now they are 64-bit, so they changed name to RAX to RDX. Also, 64-bit 60, machines has many more general registers. Uh, they, they didn't have a name before, so now we call them just uh, R8 to R15. So many more general registers. Uh, here we have those control or configuration registers. Uh, CR, I think it's, I don't know if it stands for control or configuration, but anyway, uh, for example, CR3 is a special register to store the memory, ta memory table lo uh, location, the physical address of that. I talked about this a little bit uh, last class. Uh, there are other system registers. Uh, there are debug registers, DR. Uh, there are uh, segment registers. We still use them. Uh, historically, they were very important registers. Now we use them for different purposes. Uh, the flag registers and also uh, those other registers used by the kernel, a low-level program, like uh, a global descriptor translation record. Uh, so I here, I know it's uh, interrupt descriptor, uh, L probably is local descriptor. So those are related to the uh, OS internal uh, concepts, uh, which we do not cover in this class. So you can see, uh, those are the some of the registers in the x86 architecture. If you look at a different architecture, ARM um, or MIPS, um, it will be similar. Um, they will also have those general registers. Um, they will have different uh, system registers, especially for embedded systems. They have a lot of system registers, even peripherals. They could be memory mapped. Um, if you want to control a peripheral, uh, you basically directly play with its registers. Uh, in Intel, there are in special instructions for you to talk to peripherals for uh, embedded systems are different. So uh, next, we are going to look at the instructions, um, what do they look like for x86? So each instruction in x86 have this format. There could be an optional label. Doesn't have to be there. At assembly language level, you can have a label. Machine code, obviously, no label. Then there is a, uh, uh, how do I pronounce this? Me, me, memonic? Okay. Uh, basically, this is explain what this instruction is and also help people to remember this. Then there could be many uh, operands, basically parameters, arguments to this instruction. Uh, I think there could be more than three. Some of the instructions may be more than three. Um, some of the instructions, they do not really have arguments. So the argument could be an uh, uh, Intermediate value, it could be a register, it could be also be a memory uh, address. Uh, usually, there is a source uh, operand or several source operands and one destination operand. Um, 
let's say some several examples. Um, uh, HRT, that's an instruction that do not take any argument. Uh, this instruction will just uh, uh, stop the CPU, uh, maybe to save power. Uh, there is INC instruction, which take a register or memory location as parameter. It will just increase one of that, the value of the in that register or the memory. Then we have addition to add uh, two registers together. <coughs> also, we can have an integer multiply, which have um, uh, three operands. Uh, one of them will be the destination of that. There are generally two different uh, syntax at the assembly language level. Um, historically, a lot of a lot of people are using the AT&T syntax. Um, GCC, the default is also uh, AT&T syntax. Also, uh, a lot of open source tools, their default choice was AT&T syntax. Uh, this is a little bit weird because the CPU is developed by Intel. Uh, why we do not just use Intel syntax? Uh, maybe there were legal reasons uh, decades ago. I don't know. But now the tools usually they support both. Uh, I have been using AT&T syntax for my class, but uh, last year I'm switching to Intel syntax because it's more consistent with other uh, architecture syntax. For example, ARM, MIPS, uh, they usually have some similar syntax. And switching to Intel syntax uh, make, makes the students um, make the transition from Intel to architecture to other architecture easier for students. Uh, that's why I switched. So those instructions are all in uh, Intel syntax. So some of you took my class probably that time I was still using AT&T syntax. I don't remember. So here, let's say uh, we have uh, four um, move instructions. Uh, their purpose is just to move some data from memory or register to memory or register, okay? So the first instruction we have is uh, move um, the bracket EAX, EBX. So in this AT&T syntax, the source, the, the destination is always the first operand. So this is con consistent with uh, many other uh, architectures. Usually we, we use um, the first operand as the destination. So the Bracket here means this is a memory location. This is not a register. And the memory location's address is in the register. So this instruction means we are uh, moving, <coughs> we are moving four bytes um, from the register uh, EBX to the memory location at EAX. Uh, the explanation here is actually not correct. Uh, I've been using this for too long. I didn't really check if they are correct. Okay. So basically we're moving the content in register EBX to the memory. EBX is a register. We move to a memory. The memory's address is at EAX. Then the second instruction is move uh, what is at the memory address ESI minus four. Uh, whatever is stored there, we note that. Then we note that into the register uh, EAX. Uh, you can also do some uh, calculations to help you to implement something like an array with different uh, instructions. So the instructions, you can say, even in the instructions, you can do some simple calculations. Uh, the, the CPU can directly do that. Some of the architecture cannot do that, but uh, Intel architecture, they can't do that. Uh, that's why the Intel architecture is called the uh, complex instruction set architecture. Uh, also, the mobile and uh, embedded systems right now, they are using the RISC architecture, a reduced instruction set. The instructions will be much simpler. They will not have a complicated instructions like this, which means there will be to, to achieve the purpose of this instruction, there will be there will be multiple instructions. Okay, not only one instruction to, to do the job. So some of the instructions could be uh, ambiguous. Uh, that's why at the assembly language level, uh, we can specify 
uh, the size of something. For example, here, we are moving number two into the memory dbx. Uh, this one is a little bit um, bigger. Um, we don't know the size of two. Two could be one byte. It could be four bytes, right? The, the meaning of this instruction could be moving number two to one byte in memory. It could also mean moving number two in one byte of memory, then the, the nearby three bytes will be set to zero. So the whole thing will still be the number two, right? So this could be a little bit confusing. That's why the assembly level, we can specify where moving one byte, or we are moving four bytes, or we can even moving uh, eight bytes to uh, avoid the ambiguity there. So that's basically what um, move instructions are. <coughs> there are several um, data movement instructions besides the move that is very important to understand the security problem because uh, one of the first the software security, native software security problem was buffer overflow. And when we say buffer, we mean buffer on the function stack. And how is stack created in the first place? It's using instructions like push and pop. So push uh, where put something onto the stack, how it works is it's going to, there is a register, the ESP. That ESP points to where the top of the stack is. Uh, then it will put something onto the stack, which means that on most architectures, the stack goes from high address to low address. Physically, a high address to low address, which means if you are adding something to the stack, you are decreasing the stack register. Uh, so what, what it does is to decrement the stack register by four bytes, then place the operands at that location. Uh, you can push a register value, you can push a memory address, the value will be pushed. Uh, also, you can push a constant. Uh, the opposite operation from push is pop. Uh, pop will just retrieve something from the stack and move that to a register. For example, you can do pop EDI. EDI is a register. Pop is the is the instruction. Basically, it will pop whatever the ESP the register points to, move that to the EDI register. That's what it does. Uh, there are some weirder uh, instructions. Um, uh, load effective address. Uh, basically, do a quick calculation. Uh, we probably were. Let's skip this one. Then there are some arithmetic instructions, uh, and subtract, multiply, uh, shift things to left, to right. Those are those instructions. Uh, also control flow instructions, um, jump, uh, to transfer the program control flow to the instruction at a particular memory location. Uh, there could be also uh, indirect jumps. Uh, they have the format like a J, then the condition. Those are, not, not sorry, not indirect jumps. They also are conditional jumps. So, for example, uh, JE means jump when equal. But this instruction itself doesn't compare whether two values are equal or not. So the previous instruction should compare if two values are equal or not. And the results will be saved in the flag register, the E flag. So this instruction will only check the flag register uh, if the uh, maybe the zero bit or equal bit is set. Then it will um, jump to some particular location. Uh, there are also uh, J N E not equal, uh, J J uh, greater than equal to less than those two. So. Um, so here's one example. Usually what you do is you compare two values. The both values are in register in this case. You compare EBX with EAX. Then based on the results, the results will go to the E flag register and the JLE will 
will decide where to transfer the control accordingly based on the result of that. So the compare instruction um, just compare two values. So under the hood, it's just do a subtraction, but it will not put the subtraction value back to the destination regist register. Technically, this instruction, there is no destination register. You will just update the uh, flag register. So uh, one of the interesting, very interesting um, instruction is the core instruction. So all of you have been writing um, programs. And in programs, you have functions. Usually, you have many functions. One function could call another function. And uh, eventually, at the CPU level, uh, it compiled into this core instruction, those functions compiled into the core instruction. Uh, in this architecture, x86, the core instruction uh, does two things. Uh, it first pushes the current code location to the stack in the memory. Or you let's say you call a function, then when this one returns back, you are going to execute the instruction after the call, right? There is a call instruction. If when the call comes back, you are supposed to execute the instruction after the call. So that instruction's address, the next instruction's address will be pushed onto the stack. Uh, then it does an unconditional jump uh, to the target, wherever you are calling to. Uh, so if you remember those two op uh, operations, it will be uh, much easier to understand how it works. So that's a call instruction. This is, this is actually an instruction. So uh, with a call, then there is a return. Uh, in say, you have a return. That's a keyword. In many other languages, you have something similar. Or at the end of a function that is implied, there is a return, right? So um, those, those code um, will eventually be compiled to the return instruction. Uh, the return instruction is the opposite operation of the call. Uh, it basically, it pops what uh, ESP points to and pops that to the uh, program counter. That's it. It were, so that ESP, uh, that address, we store it in the memory. We store that on stack. Then we retrieve that address, move that into our program counter or uh, instruction pointer, uh, that important register. So the runtime stack uh, support the procedure course, uh, passing of parameters between procedures. And the stack is located in memory. Uh, most architectures, the stack goes from high address to low address. Uh, when we push a value, the ESP will decrement. When we pop a value, ESP will increment. Um, there are um, several other instructions, like enter, uh, will create a function frame. Uh, it's equivalent to those three instructions. Uh, when later, when we encounter cases using those instructions, we will go deeper. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, we just skip this. Since there's a enter, there is also a leave. Uh, so enter is one instruction. It's equivalent to uh, those three instructions. Push EBP, move ESP to EBP, then subtract some number from ESP. Because those three instructions are used so frequently, uh, that's why Intel introduced a new instruction called enter. So the program will be smaller. And uh, maybe there will be optimization, makes things faster. Previously, three instructions, now only one instructions. Uh, leave will just be move EBP to ESP, then just pop. Okay. So the 64 bit version, uh, like I said, uh, similar to 32 bit. First of all, it's backward compatible. You can still run 32 bit program on 34 bit machine. But there are some new registers like those ones R8, R9, R15. Uh, those are new ones. Uh, they didn't exist in a uh, 32 bit version. Um, if we look at this program, uh, the uh, long addition, 
um, in this program, I'm trying to, uh, this is actually a long, long addition. Um, in the main function, you can see we have two global variables, but the previous one we are using integer, int. Now we are using long, long, and uh, long, long in both architecture will be 64 bit. So A is 64 bit, B is also 64 bit. So they are local variables. So local variables, technically, uh, most compilers will put them on stack. But if uh, you want to, you want the program to be really fast, uh, they can be stored on in register directly. Uh, but the problem is, um, this is 64 bit. So even if for 32 bit machine, no, no register can hold this, right? Because the value is 64 bit. 32 bit machine, the register is only 32 bit. Um, we are just adding them together. So the same program, almost the same program. So then let's take a look uh, how they are different. We first look at the 32-bit code. Um, my internet is down. Is everyone experiencing unstable internet last two days? Not really. I was at my office, I was having a meeting yesterday and uh, the, the Wi-Fi was really unstable. Let me try. Okay, hope I'm connected again. Uh, by the way, this, this website, uh, you can only access uh, when you are on UB network. Um, so if you are off campus, you have to VPN in to access this website. Uh, we're trying to make this public, but uh, uh, it, it will take some time. Let's say we have the 32-bit version. We run the 32-bit version first. We uh, we don't, yeah, let, let's just run this a little bit. You can add the two numbers together, right? And it tells you the size of long long is uh, eight bytes. Uh, the, this addition is correct. Uh, so if we do an OBJ dump, so OBJ dump basically is a disassembler. It is, you feed that with a battery program and it tells you what instructions it has. Uh, there are many more advanced tools. Uh, some of them are uh, commercial tools, very expensive. Uh, some of them are free. Uh, NSF, uh, uh, not NSF, NSA open sourced their disassembler several years ago called Ghidra. Uh, it's a good one. And then there is a commercial one called Ida Pro. Some of you probably heard of that before. That's very expensive, but uh, uh, right now it's still one of the best. Um, so if we do a object dump of this one, we are going to look at the um, this part. So this is 32-bit version. We are adding two numbers together, and you can see what we are doing is oh, this is. Oh, sorry, I should change to, let me change to Intel architecture. Um, Intel syntax, sorry. Okay, now we are going to Intel syntax. The default one is the at and syntax. The, the, now this is Intel syntax. Okay, so you can see that um, we already run the program. You can see that I put two numbers there and we want to add them together. So. This is the function that eventually add them together. Uh, this function only have this six, seven instructions. The first instruction, it will move four bytes at ESP plus some value. ESP is a part of the stack. So ESP points to the stack. So we are moving some value from the stack to the register EAX. Then we are moving another four bytes to EDX. Even though we know the number we are adding is eight bytes, there is no register can directly do that. So we are using two registers, EAX and EDX. Then we are moving what EAX points to to EAX. Then we do an addition of um, uh, whatever is on the stack uh, to the EAX. That's the first addition. That will actually add the lower 32-bit because, so we're adding two 64-bit numbers. The first step, we add the lower 32 bits of two numbers. After that, 
there may be a carry, right? That's 32 bit and 32 bit. The result should be 33 bit, not 32 bit. The, 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 the most significant bit will be, could be, could be one, right? So that's why the second addition, we add the higher 32 bit of those two 64 bit numbers. But now we have, when we add them, we need to consider if the lower 32 bit has a carry. That's why we use a different instruction, which is ADC. The C here means carry. So not the original ADD instruction anymore. So this one will take the carry of the previous instruction into account. So uh, that's, that's how it works. Okay, so six instructions. If we go to the 64-bit version, Here. So the 64 bit version, we run this again. We just, right? The long long is also eight bytes. If we do a OBJ dump, D means uh, disassemble, uh, M means uh, the syntax you want to use. The default is. AT&T, oh, we don't need this part. We go for that. Now you can see the 64-bit version, the same C code. Uh, we actually only have four instructions. Uh, the first instruction doesn't matter. It's not for this function, it's for security. Uh, actually, it's only two instructions. Now we're only using the register RAX, which is 64 bits. So we are adding, we are moving one of the values to RAX. Um, actually, one of the values are already in RAX. Um, that's why uh, one of the values is already in RSI, actually. Um, so that's why we uh, move one of the re two register, then we just uh, uh, add them together. So this is the 64-bit version. Okay, you, you probably do not understand every instruction, but you can say uh, at least one of them is using uh, smartly using 32-bit registers to do 64-bit calculation. Another one doesn't have to be smart; it's already there. It's very easy to use. So that's a difference between. Um, uh, different, uh, oh, this one actually changed the code. Uh, one of them are using address. Uh, the, the code is a little bit different. Um, so those are the instructions. Um, so next we will talk a little bit about what is uh, set UID program uh, on Linux or Usenix systems. Uh, we have a special permission for programs. Uh, that's why called the set UID programs. Uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, last class. Uh, every Linux or Usenix process has uh, three user IDs associated with it. Uh, one is real ID. One is called real ID. This is the ID of the user or process that created this um, process. Um, Another one is called uh, effective UID. So uh, this is this is the ID that um, usually used to check the privilege of the uh, process. Uh, also, there is a safety UID. Uh, that one, most cases, not that important. So by default. Uh, the kernel makes the decision whether a process has the privilege of something uh, by uh, looking at the effective UID of the process. For most of the programs, uh, like our LS, um, we just uh, use um, the kernel will use the effective UID. Uh, however, those programs are called long set UID programs. Uh, however, if a program, we configure that program as a set UID program, um, then 
the process will change the effective user ID uh, from the default whoever started the program to the owner of the program. Uh, let's say, for example, this is my my this is my oldest ThinkPad actually. So I, I'm not using ThinkPad anymore. So so on my old ThinkPad, you can say this is my bin folder. In this bin folder, I have many programs I can run. Uh, two programs here, you can say they have a different color. They are red. That's because they are set UID programs. This is actually showing in here. So the first three columns, they are for the user's permission. And the last column, this program is S. That means this program is a set UID program. Uh, other programs, you can say it's X, means this is executable, but it's not a set UID program. So even though this is my computer, I logged in as the user, uh, them in here. Obviously, when logging, I do not use, I do not use root. But the owner of those programs, they are all root. You can say that the owner of root. So even though, for let's say there is a sleep program, even though I'm not zooming, it's not the owner of this program. I will be able to execute this program, run this program, because the permission says everyone can run this program. The last three column means basically everyone, what everyone can do. Everyone can run this program, so I can run it. But when I run this program, its permission will be checked against my permission, Zeming's permission. However, for set UID programs, like this one, SU, it's not going to, this is, this is a set UID program. So when, no matter who runs this program, the permission of the program will be the root user's root program, not whoever runs the program's permission. So go back to, our server, you can say that uh, this is how we designed uh, the the server. Um, by the way, we uh, we we didn't really design this platform. Uh, this platform is an open source platform called uh, CTFD, uh, but we did modify a lot of things on top of this platform. Um, let's say so. Uh, this is for last semester. That's the midterm. There are four challenges. So how does it work? Is yeah for the midterm thirty seven solve this challenge. So how it works is you run this program. In this file system, there is a file called flag. Okay, that's a flag file. And when you log in, you log in as the user CTF. You do not log in as the user root. But this flag file belongs to root. And if you check the permission here, you can see that uh, everyone else do not have the permission to read or write this file. So when you're logging as the user CTF, if you want to cat flag, uh, you will get permission delight because you don't have permission to do this. Um, however, this program itself, I give you this, this program. Uh, this is a challenge program. This is a vulnerable battery. This program is a set UID program, as shown here, S, and also it's red in the terminal. Because this is a set UID program, even if you log in as CTF, when you run this program, this program will have root privilege. So this program has the permission to read the flag file. Okay. So, so what you need to do is you need to exploit the software vulnerability in this program to get the flag. After you get the flag, then uh, you can submit the flag. Uh, let's just uh, use any of those. Then you can submit the flag here. So the flag is basically a random string. For everyone, it's a different random string. You submit this. So this is all the, how the system um, is designed. Um, so let's look at another example. Um, we have a, we have another challenge on the platform. It's called read secret. Let's say read secret. Cert, yeah, thirty-two bit version will be okay. 
So this is a read secret challenge. And you can see this challenge itself is a set UID program. Uh, this program, what it does is it doesn't really do anything um, besides it, uh, it reads the flag for you. Uh, it will print out uh, your, the program's UID uh, and also print out the program's um, effective UID. Then it will just print the flag. Print the flag. By print the flag, you can say it will just open the flag file in the root directory, then just print it out. So if you just do a cat flag, you will not be able to read that. But if you run this program, it will give you the flag. And it also tells you that when you run this program, your UID is 1000, which is the UID of a CTF. However, your effective UID is uh, root in this case. And uh, uh, this, this is uh, basically the content in that flag file, and this is a flag. So if you copy this, and you go back to our system, and uh, uh, then you can, you can submit this, uh, then, then where you will get the flag. So that's how our system works. So in the next two weeks, you will see um, more complicated examples, but uh, they're still baby steps. So let's say we still have some time, and we'll go through um, L files. So for uh, Linux systems, the executable files are called the uh, L files. Their format is the L files. Um, uh, Windows have a different format. Uh, they use uh, the Windows portable executable format, the PE format. Uh, Mac also use L format, I believe. Um, so for Windows users, uh, you are maybe used to the concept of uh, extension. Uh, on Windows, the file extension is quite important. Uh, it basically tells you what this file is. Uh, on Linux, uh, not necessarily. The extension is just part of the name. Uh, doesn't matter that much. Uh, that's why for L files, uh, we have seen all kinds of uh, extensions. Uh, usually, uh, for uh, for example, AF, AXF, usually we use that extension for uh, embedded system, uh, firmware. Uh, uh, KO, usually we use for uh, kernel object, which means kernel modules. Uh, SO we use for uh, static libraries. Uh, o is just uh, your C code compared to a .o file. There are others like ELF or even binary bin. Um, so ELF file has its own uh, format. You can use the file command to which tells you what a file is uh, based on the file header. Um, so if let's say we have the ls uh, program, then we do a, a file ls. It tells me this is a l file, uh, 64 bit. This is um, dynamically linked. When we run this program, um, the uh, interpreter is at this address. So the kernel should load this interpreter into the address space. Uh, this is a stripped executable, which means the debugging information were not there anymore. Right. Uh, we can also use other tools like readelf to uh, show us the whole architecture of the file. You can say this is the a header of this file, and there are many different uh, sections of this L file. Uh, usually, our uh, code could be in the code section. Uh, there are uh, elite is also code. Yeah, uh, this is basically for initialization of code. Uh, there are uh, interpreter sections, uh, dynamic symbol sections, uh, string sections, uh, many different sections. Uh, many tools were developed to uh, analyze or parse L files. 
uh, when you compile, obviously you use GCC, you use LLVM, you can compile directly to L file. Uh, read ELF to pass the header to give you basic knowledge of this. Uh, OPJ dump, we have been using that today in the class. It gives you the disassembly of the code. Uh, NM to view the symbols. If you want to change the L file directly, there are also tools, a patch and also a object copy uh, to change those. If you want to remove the debugger information symbols, you can use a script. Also, there are libraries for you to uh, do this. For um, a Linux process, um, or for um, all the multitasking operating systems, uh, each process uh, runs in its own memory address space. Uh, it has a sandbox. For 32-bit machine, that sandbox is a, a 4GB memory address. 32-bit, that's 4GB. Uh, 64 bit much bigger, but right now all our 684 bit machines, uh, your Windows, your Linux, the address space is not fully 64 bit actually. It's, it's probably 39 bit, 40 bit, something like that. Not a full 64 bit. Um, those virtual addresses are eventually mapped to physical memories uh, by something called the page tables. Uh, page table itself is stored in the memory as well. And uh, where that page table is stored, um, you specify that in that special control register CR3. Uh, so if you only program in Usenet, you don't worry about this because kernel does all of that. So for a 32-bit machine, uh, usually this is what a uh, memory map look like. Um, but for security reasons, uh, this has been changed. 64-bit version, this has been randomized. Um, but uh, let's say a simplified version, it looks like this. The, for every program, there is a 4GB virtual address space. The higher 1GB is actually reserved for the kernel. Uh, the lower 3GB is for each program. Each program has a view of this. And there are a text segment. Uh, those are basically where your code is, your instructions are. Then there are data segment, uh, dot data section. <coughs> those are usually for initialized global variables or static variables. It, they are initialized. Then there are BSS segment. So those are also for stack static variables or global variables, but they are not initialized. So imagine when your kernel or your interpreter loader load a program from the hard disk to the memory. It has to load this initialized part because that's stored in the program, in the hard disk, load that. But the BSS part, you didn't initialize that. In, in C, if you didn't initialize a global variable, that global variable should be uh, automatically initialized to zero. But it's, in that case, we already know the value is zero. So you don't have to load zero from hard disk to the memory, right? You just need to reserve that space and that whole space, you just uh, set it to zero. So that is a BSS section. So those, those regions are not really directly loaded from hard disk to memory because you don't have to. Uh, then there is heap. Uh, that's where you use malloc, you use uh, canlock. Uh, oh, I plan to talk about heap security later. Uh, then there are also other memory mapped regions. Uh, usually use system called like mmap to do that. Uh, usually the libraries are loaded into the process using mmap. Then there are stacks. Uh, I use plural here because um, the programs you are running, you are writing today are multi-thread programs and each thread, they actually have their own stack. So it's not like we have a single stack. There are multiple stacks. So those stacks go from higher address to low address. Uh, that's our uh, memory, uh, basically our memory. So, so the a null pointer in C++, um, is basically defined as the address zero. 
Okay. But address zero is still a valid address, right? So think about you have a physical memory or a virtual memory. The zero, address zero is a still valid address. How can you make this address invalid? So when you dereference this, the system tells you, hey, this doesn't exist. Because we define the zero doesn't exist in C language or other language, right? So this basically how it defines and also back in the system. Uh, so back in the system, that's why at the very beginning, you can say, we have nothing here. The virtual address of the process at the very beginning, at the address zero, this is not a physical address, it's a virtual address. We have nothing there. So if you dereference zero, it's not going to really read from virtual address zero. We define that doesn't exist. We do not really map those. Okay. So this is how at a C level, we want to show the address zero doesn't exist. And this is how uh, we really implement this at the um, process level. Uh, this, uh, I also write a very simple, this is a very simple program to show you the memory map of, um, the, the Linux program. Uh, th this program doesn't do anything. Just wait for your one character input, then just execute, then just, uh, exit. Uh, but it shows you the memory map. So, um, you can, you can do this on the server. I think on the server we have a program like this called, um, a uh, process map, 32-bit and 64-bit. Um, here I will just show you uh, what I have on the slides. Um, you can see this is uh, this is 32-bit version, I believe. So the 32-bit version, you can say um, this is this is higher, this is lower address, this is uh, higher address. You can see uh, in this map, the higher address we have stack. Uh, we cannot go beyond the uh, kernel. Then we have several libraries. You can see those are libraries. So those are basically the memory mapped regions. Uh, more libraries here. And then there is heap. That's a heap. Then we have the a PM, which which is the name of the program. So PM here basically means its own section. You see, there are three sections. So they are most likely to be the text section, uh, data section, and BSS section. A uh, sixty-four bit version. Also similar, uh, you can also say some other sections like uh, VSYS call, uh, VDSO. Uh, those are sections for uh, fast uh, context switch between uh, kernel and the user space. Uh, they were introduced in the last uh, 20 years of uh, uh, Linux. So also you can say 64-bit, uh, the address is also longer because the address is 64-bit. Uh, even though we're not using the full 64 bit. Okay, so that's basically the background knowledge you need to, for the next uh, two weeks to, to learn, uh, software security. So next two weeks, we're going to study, uh, some of the challenges here, uh, not all of them. Uh, uh, we're looking at several, uh, buffer overflows, uh, format string and also and also um, ROP, Return Already Programming. Uh, any questions? Okay, uh, homework three will be released uh, tomorrow and uh, I will also give you uh, seven to 10 days to finish the homework. Um, Homework three will be uh, quite lightweight compared to homework two. Uh, then see you guys next Monday.